Testing, testing. You adjusting to Morgan? Oh, my parents have both been first for 50 years and now they're from Michigan. They don't tell me that it's like 80 degrees and dry up here. <laughs> Sometimes when it gets snow, it's like I'm here, some here, some not in the ocean. Very true.
shot up. We've had it. And I mean, the only thing that awaits us now is just death. <laughs> oh, there's a lot more to come than just that, right? <laughs> I don't know. Lots of stuff. You got grandkids, kids, <laughs> right? How's your day been? You been busy? Oh, I don't know if you call it busy. We went skiing today, so. Oh. That was fun. You're a skier. Snow basin. Snow basin. Do they have quite a crowd up there? You know, we, we love going up there because it's such a big mountain, and the lifts move so quick that we rarely wait. I think we waited maybe five minutes today to huh. climb up. The rest of the time, we just skied on. Well, yeah, these hills look kind of steep. I mean, they look pretty dry, but it's fun. When I was a teenager, I had a twin brother, and we went just over here on the dry fall skiing. Okay. And he went down first, and then I started down at an angle, but I ended up in his tracks, and I didn't know how to turn. And I kept hollering at him, and he didn't look up, and I plowed into him. That ended in skiing. Oh, that was it, huh? That was it. Never went again. Well, we've, uh, we've had a few crashes. We've gotten <laughs> out just fine so far. And well, the problem is, as fast as you go on them, the, the crash, you get hurt. you got to be careful, right? Oh, that's right. So your wife, does she ski? She actually snowboards. Oh. So I ski, all the kids ski, and she's a snowboarder in the family. Is the snowboarding hard? I think it's r like anything, right? As long as you do it enough times, you'll be just fine at it. But um, I fell one time, so I said, snowboard. And I'm like, okay, I'll do it one. And I fell one time backwards, and it's hard to catch yourself backwards, right? Oh, yeah. And when I hit my backside, it... I'll just stick to skiing. <laughs> I, I did okay there, but but only snowboarding. I have a son that snowboards, and I think he likes it. I haven't talked to him much, but oh, it's all fun. It's fun to be out there and get sled down. That's what I think I like the most about it. You get to put the kids out there and play. Do you see deer up that high when you're up there? Moose. Moose. I've never seen deer up there, but I've encountered moose probably. So they get up high still. Yeah. Huh. And them long legs, I guess that's not a problem for them. Yeah, and apparently they love to eat pork brush. Huh? Yeah. It's pretty. Well, I've been up to a couple of weddings to that building that's up on the top there. Oh, yeah. It's way up at the top. Yeah. Okay. And we went up on the lift, and that was, that was kind of nice, but it was summer. Oh, nice and warm out there? Uh-huh. Good size, I know that. Yeah. Yeah, we're having fun. Get the lift up I there and have fun. And I, 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 I wondered how the hill cleared up there. Yeah, we were able to get another up on there. Oh, okay. Yeah, they so they could they could haul the stuff up the ladder. <laughs> yeah, in, in the winter it's just a ski run, right? And then summer they go all the way. Yeah. Sean, you look good from this distance. down here a couple months. Yeah, I just uh, went over to uh, let's see, the equipment at my work here in Portland. He's probably your labor. Yeah, yeah. I'm the labor all in. <laughs> yeah, if you're a critter, then you'd be the labor. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey man, it's hard to see your face because it's been years since I've seen you in person. Well, his uncle, his dad's Don, and his uncle's uh, Charles, and Charles had four or five daughters. Yeah. And one lives over here. Yeah. Is that the one? Don just wants to go to his house. So that's why he was here. That, that was Charles. How about Herb? Do you know Herb? Herb? Herb is his cousin. Yeah. Okay, so their cousin. So the Herb is, is Charles. Charles. And, then and he's from Bowman. Okay. Cool. Well, let's, let's do some money. Are we ready? All right. Brothers and sisters, thank you for being with us tonight. We're grateful to have Brother Stevens again, and uh, I will begin with the word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we 
thank Thee that we can gather here tonight at home or wherever we may be and be able to learn from Brother Stevens. We ask that Thy Spirit be with him and also with us, that we might be able to understand the teachings and also a little bit more about the scriptures. We're grateful for the prophets that have left, left us the teachings, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this evening we will start with section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants, if you want to turn there with me. Just by way of historical setting, it's August 1830, the prophet is in harmony. He has met with uh, Newell Knight, his wife Sally, and Joseph's wife Emma, and then John Whitmer. There's five of them who are present. Sally Knight and Emma were baptized back in June, but they've never been confirmed members of the church. They decide that they want to pass the sacrament and then confirm these two uh, ladies members of the church. Joseph Smith then goes out to procure uh, wine so that they can uh, have the sacrament. So with that in mind, we'll pick it up in verse 1. Listen to the voice of Jesus Christ, your Lord, your God, your Redeemer, whose word is quick and powerful. Behold, I say unto you, that it matters not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink. When ye partake of the sacrament, if it so be, ye do it with an eye single to my glory. Remembering unto the Father my body, which was laid down for you, and my blood, which was shed for the remission of your sins. Note then that the sacrament is a remembrance ordinance. The Apostle Paul speaks of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, where he also uh, comments that the sacrament is a remembrance ordinance. Wherefore, a commandment I give unto you, you shall not purchase wine, neither strong drink of your enemies. Uh, an obvious reason for that is because uh, the prophet would be poisoned. We should mention that even though it says the voice of Jesus Christ, it's an angel who has met uh, with the prophet and who speaks in first person uh, as the authorized agent for the Savior. Now, with those five verses becomes an introduction to something that's one of the most significant things in all of the Doctrine and Covenants, and that's this great meeting at Adam on Thy Almond. Verse 5 through 18 deals with the meeting, but I suggest to you tonight there's an order in which to study that meeting so that it makes sense. So I'm going to start first in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 7 where Daniel uh, sees this sacred occasion, and he speaks of it mostly in symbolic imagery, but mo most of which we can understand. So Daniel 7, I'm going to start with verse 9, 9 through 14. This is the vision. Joseph, or Daniel sees this great uh, council that will be held in northern Missouri. He says in verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. Those thrones are the worldly governments mentioned in verse 1 through 8, and the symbols that's given is the symbols of beast. Beast denotes something degraded and evil. I would assume Joseph Smith could have probably put the name of the country on the beast, but for wisdom's sake was told not to do that, so I don't know exactly what countries he's talking about simply that they'll be thrown down. That denotes ter uh, tremendous violence. The Ancient of Days did sit. The Ancient of Days is uh, Adam. To sit means he's come to judge and to preside, whose garment was white as snow, meaning he wears the robes of sanctification. He is holy, he is pure, he is clean. And the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, meaning great glory. 
his wheels as burning fire. The wheels is the symbol of the chariot, also the symbol that he moves with power and that he can move where he needs to and that the chariot also is in great glory. Verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. If you multiply that, that's 100 million. And that is not necessarily how many people he's saying will be in the meeting. A hundred million is used in the Old Testament represents an infinite host. It could be far greater than that uh, that will be in attendance at this meeting. It says, stood before him, the judgment was set, the judgment dealing with the second coming. This is a pre-second coming event. The books were opened. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. The horn denotes a worldly government and horn denotes power. I beheld even till the beast was slain, his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. We're just going to have to be patient on that imagery of what countries that they deal with in this chapter. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. This great council is held while the worldly governments are still intact and they're still evil on the earth. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Man should always be uppercased. That's the title for Christ, who is the Son of the Man of Holiness, Moses 7, verse 35. When it says one like, that's the way the Hebrews wrote. They never went directly at deity. They always kind of come around to the side, which in their mind shows respect. So it is the Son of Man. He came with the clouds of heaven, meaning he comes to the meeting in great glory. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. Joseph Smith said, the part of the meeting is a stewardship accounting and that the stewardship from Adam eventually will be turned back to Christ who then will preside over the earth during the great millennial reign. Now the next reference we turn to is Doctrine and Covenants section 116. This particular reference identifies the location of the meeting or the place where this great council is going to be held. Section 116, just one verse. Spring Hill is named by the Lord Adam on thy almond. Spring Hill has no meaning and no significance. When the saints settled in that area, there was a series of springs there, so they just naturally called it Spring Hill. All the Savior's telling them is, the place you called Spring Hill, let me tell you what it is. It is named by the Lord Adam on thy almond, meaning the place or land of God where Adam dwelt. Because, said he, it is the place where Adam shall come to visit his people, or the Ancient of Days shall sit, as spoken of by Daniel the prophet, which we just read, Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 through 14. Now we know the location of the meeting. It will be held at a place called Spring Hill, Missouri, which is in the northern part of Missouri, uh, 60, 70 miles north of Independence. Now let's turn to Doctrine and Covenants, section 107. And this is the type. What a type is, is the Savior gives us a glimpse of what the meeting will be like by going back and telling us what the meeting was like when it was first held. That's what a type is. It points to something else. Starting with verse 53. Three years previous to the death of Adam, which means he's 927 years old. He called Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, and Methuselah, who are all high priests, which means they were all presiding high priests, with the residue of his posterity who were righteous. No, it doesn't say men. It says that he called the residue of his posterity who were righteous. That's men and women into the valley of Adam on the almond. There bestowed upon them his last blessing. The Lord appeared unto them. Note, the Son of God makes a personal appearance in this meeting. And they, those in attendance, rose up and blessed Adam. 
and called him Michael. The word Michael means who is like God or as God. The prince, a prince stands in a position to be a king. A prince is a member of the royal family. In this case, the royal family is God the Father. The archangel, archangel means he's chief or preeminent. That is an office that he holds. <clears throat> he is the archangel on this earth. The Lord administered comfort unto Adam and said unto him, I have set thee to be at the head. That's where it's officially announced in that meeting that Adam presides over this earth. A multitude of nations shall come of thee. Thou art a prince over them forever. Now that's an important phrase also. Adam presides over this planet, which will be a celestial planet. Out of the nations of the earth will come a multitude of people who will be exalted. He'll preside over those who live a lower law, terrestrial, celestial, will be put on other uh, worlds. They will not reside on this one. So note how many, a multitude of nations. There are multiple places where it explains that it'll be an infinite host that will come off of this earth to their exaltation. Our Heavenly Father's plan works. We just have to keep the commandments and endure to the end and we'll be part of this exalted family. He says, thou, and thou art a prince over them forever. Adam stood up in the midst of the congregation, notwithstanding he was bowed down with age, being full of the Holy Ghost, predicted whatsoever should befall his posterity unto the latest generation. So in that meeting, prophetically, he talks about the various dispensations. He surely would have covered Enoch in the translation of his city. He would have mentioned the mighty Abraham, Melchizedek. Surely Moses' name was brought up and discussed. Peter, James, and John in the Meridian Dispensation. And certainly the name of Joseph Smith was brought up in that meeting. And Adam prophesied of the mighty seer of the last dispensation. Verse 57, these things, the prophecy and what happened in the meeting, were all written in the book of Enoch and are to be testified of in due time. Everything that was prophesied, everything that took place in that meeting has been recorded in the book of Enoch. Now, whether he actually kept the record on that occasion or others under his direction kept it, I don't know. But we are promised that in due time, we will have access to that record and we will learn more about this great meeting. Now, let's turn to Matthew chapter 26. We have looked at the reference on the vision, the one on the location of the meeting, the one that deals with the type. Now we turn to Matthew 26, and this is the prophecy concerning this meeting. Matthew 26. This is the last night of the Son of God's life upon the earth. Verse 26 through 28, he's introduced to them the sacrament. And then in verse 29 is the prophecy. But I say unto you, uh, you is the quorum of the twelve, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. A great prophecy that was made that night. That same prophecy is found in Mark 14, verse 25, and Luke 22, verse 18. Luke 22, verse 18. Now we are prepared to go back into Doctrine and Covenants, section 27. In section 27, the Savior now begins to make a list of those who will be able to attend this meeting and to participate in it. So we start now with verse five. Behold, this is wisdom in me, verse one through four. Marvel not, now note, for the hour. That denotes a very short period of time. Cometh that I will drink of the fruit of the vine with you on the earth. Where did we just read that? Matthew 26, verse 29. So that becomes our introduction now to who's going to be at the meeting. There's the first one when he says, with you, you is Joseph Smith. We would assume that, that logically that Joseph Smith would be at the meeting. And with Moroni, he will be there. 
whom I send unto you to reveal the Book of Mormon, containing the fullness of my everlasting gospel, to whom I have committed the keys of the record of the stick of Ephraim. So Moroni has already come and has worked uh, with the prophet Joseph Smith and will continue to do so until the translation is completed. So he's going to make a list of those who have come or will come to Joseph Smith with their keys and their teachings, but he's also making a list of those who will be in this uh, sacrament meeting. So there is two of them, Joseph Smith and Moroni, now six. Also with Elias, to whom I've committed the keys of bringing to pass the restoration of all things, spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began, concerning the last days. And also John, the son of Zacharias. So John, called the Baptist, will be there. Which Zacharias, he, Elias, visited. Now the antecedent of Elias in 7 is the Elias in 6. So now we know who the Elias in 6 is. It's going to be at the meeting. His name is Noah, who has made several appearances upon the earth. Visiting gave promise he should have a son. His name should be John. He should be filled with the spirit of Elias. Which John I have sent unto you, my servants Joseph, and ordained him, and so on. Verse 9, also Elijah. Elijah will be in the meeting. He has not yet come with his keys, but he will. And we'll pick him up in section 110. Unto whom I have committed the keys of the power of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, hearts of the children to the fathers, that the whole earth may not be smitten with the curse. Also, Joseph, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, they will all be in attendance at the meeting. They also will appear to Joseph Smith and teach him. The prophets give no information on their appearance to him or what it was they taught him. Your fathers, by whom the promises remain. The promises are referred to as the Abrahamic covenant, which we should study in detail. Genesis chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 15, chapter 22, DNC 132, and 1 Nephi 15. All of those deal with the Abrahamic covenant. Also with Michael, or Adam, the father of all, the prince of all, the ancient of days. Also with Peter and James and John. But we remember we just read in Matthew 26, 29, that all of the Quorum of the Twelve will be there besides these three chief apostles, by whom I have ordained you and confirmed you to be apostles or special witnesses. Thirteen, unto whom I have committed the keys of my kingdom and a dispensation of the gospel for the last times and for the fullness of times in the which I will gather together in one all things, both which are in heaven, which are on earth. That has reference not only the restoration of all priesthood keys, but it has reference to the gathering of the family of Christ on both sides of the veil and uh, bringing them uh, all together. The reference for that is Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. Ephesians 1 Verse 10, the prophet said this concerning, uh, well, let me read 14, and then I'll explain. And also with all those whom my Father hath given me out of the world. That's a summary verse. All of those whom the Father has given him out of the world, meaning they lived in the world, but they're not part of it. All of those will be in attendance. Joseph Smith elaborated a little bit, and Elder McConkey even more. So we turn now to the prophet Joseph who said this. He said, And the Lord administered comfort unto Adam, and said unto him, I have set thee to be at the head. A multitude of nations shall come of thee. Thou art a prince over them forever. So shall it be with my father. He shall be called a prince over his posterity, holding the keys of the patriarchal priesthood over the kingdom of God on earth, even the church of the Latter-day Saints. He shall sit in the general assembly of patriarchs, even in council with the Ancient of Days, when he shall sit, and all the patriarchs with him shall enjoy his right and authority under the direction of the Ancient of Days. And blessed also is my mother, for she is a mother in Israel, and shall be a partaker with my father in all his patriarchal blessings. That comes out of the teachings of Joseph Smith, page 39. Teachings of Joseph Smith, page 39. 
So the prophet identifies that his father and his mother will also be in attendance. Put your pencil right there for a minute, and let's go to 3 Nephi to chapter 15. This is the resurrected Lord among the Nephite saints. Chapter 15, verse 24. Note this language now. But behold, ye have both heard my voice and seen me. Ye are my sheep. Ye are numbered among those whom the Father hath given me. Who else will be in that meeting? All of those wonderful Nephite saints. At the time the resurrected Lord appeared to them, all of them have a place there. Now Elder McConkie helps us to understand where we fit in when he said the following. He said, before the Lord descends openly and publicly in the clouds of glory, attended by all the hosts of heaven, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, since terror and destruction from one end of the earth to the other, before he stands on Mount Zion, or sets his feet on Olivet, or utter his voice from an American Zion or a Jewish Jerusalem, before all flesh shall see him together, before any of his appearances which taken together comprise the second coming of the Son of God, before all these there is to be a secret appearance to selected members of his church. He will come in private to his prophet and to the apostles then living. Those who have held keys and powers and authorities in all ages from Adam to the present will also be present. And further, all the faithful members of the church then living, all the faithful saints of all the ages past will be present. It will be the greatest congregation of faithful saints ever assembled on planet Earth. It will be a sacrament meeting. It will be a day of judgment for the faithful of all the ages. It will take place in Davies County, Missouri, at a place called Adam on the Amen. The reference is the Millennial Messiah, page 578-579. The Millennial Messiah, page 578-579. All of us, if we will be faithful, will be allowed to be in the meeting. Now I suggest a caution with it. We don't know how many meetings there will be held whether there's one that's simply a priesthood meeting of those who have held keys to give an account for stewardship, but at least there is a general session where all of the faith will be allowed to be in attendance and to be participants. How the Lord will involve such an infinite host, I don't have the slightest idea. I've been in northern Missouri in the Valley of Adam on the Almond multiple times, probably at least 30 times. I have been there, and I have marveled, even though it's a huge area, how all of us could be there. There has to be uh, something that we have no idea that the Savior is quite capable of handing such a vast host. And it'll all make sense to us by and by. Now verse 15 through 18, critical verses. The Savior lists the qualifications, your responsibility, if you want to be in attendance at the meeting. So these we want to make sure that we understand. So starting with verse 15. Wherefore, lift up your hearts and rejoice and gird up your loins. He's going to mention four vulnerable areas of the body that you must protect if you want to be in attendance at the meeting. There's the first one. You have to gird the loins. The loins is from the lowest uh, rib down to the hip bone and in that particular area of the body is where we find the procreative power so what he's saying when he says gird up your loins is you must protect the procreative power and become virtuous and clean take upon you my whole armor that you may able be able to withstand the evil day having done all that you may be able to stand stand therefore having your loins gird about with truth having on the breastplate of righteousness. There's the second vulnerable area of the body. The breastplate covers the chest cavity, and in that, that chest cavity is found the heart. The heart is the symbol for feelings and emotions and desires. Satan will interfere with your tender feelings and your emotions and desires. Such things as that uh, the bishop uh, doesn't like you. Uh, that's a good one that he uses all of the time. 
or the people in the ward are not friendly and you don't want to go anymore, and on and on it goes, where he will interfere with your feelings and your emotions, and we have to guard against that. Here's the third vulnerable area, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. How are the feet a vulnerable area? The feet is the part of the body that moves you to your goals. Satan will interfere with those, short-range goals, long-range goals. I've used this as an example of a short-range goal. Maybe it's you're late for church all of the time, and you finally, as a family, talk about it and discuss it, that you are so tired of people turning and watching you come in late. We are going to be on time next week. Then watch what happens. You're even later than you have been because you set a goal and the devil interfered with it. Once you overcome that, he will move on to something else. It could be a long-range goal, marriage in the temple, uh, accepting church callings in the ward and in the stake and doing the best that you can, keeping the commandments, enduring to the end, long-range goals. Now he says, which I have sent mine angels to commit unto you, taking the shield of faith. Now he's going to list two ways that he's going to help us. Here's the first one. Take the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The fiery darts is the poison the devil gets into us. If we take the shield of faith, it will stop those poison darts. The shield of faith I mentioned to you comes from like keeping commandments, hearing the word of God, and by reading the word of God. That's how one grows in faith. Satan will interfere with that, that you don't have time to go to the various meetings. And uh, you're pretty good. You go most of the time. So what's the problem if I go boating or skiing or deer hunting? It only comes a couple of times in a year. Joseph Fielding Smith said once, he said, I don't know what day the Savior will come, but he said, I've always thought maybe he'd come on Sunday. And those who are where they're supposed to be go home. Those who are not where they're supposed to be will be left for another program that's about to take place, and that's the burning. And I have thought about that. Take the shield of faith. Verse 18, he lists the fourth vulnerable area of the body. Take the helmet of salvation. The helmet covers the head. The head is the center for thoughts. And Satan uh, constantly bombards us with improper thoughts. That one is the hardest of all of them to overcome because nobody knows what you're thinking. You can get away with it so easy. And you have to spend some real time and effort to control the thoughts. My mission president, when I was a, a young teenager, he told us, he says, the thing that's helped me to control my thoughts is, he says, I picture myself landing my airplane at the Salt Lake Airport. He says, believe it or not, it's one of the hardest airports to land an airplane that there is because of the wind currents there. And he says, so I mentally concentrate on safely landing my plane. Elder Boyd K. Packer suggested that we sing a hymn. We learn a hymn and we sing it to get the the proper thoughts. Okay, there's the fourth vulnerable area. Now the second protection against all of it. Here it is. The sword of my spirit. The spirit is the Holy Ghost. The sword is the sure weapon that cuts the enemy down. The Holy Ghost will be our partner. He will inspire us. He will watch over us. He will protect us. He will comfort us. He will help us through our mortal probation. But 1 Nephi 10 is clear. You have to diligently seek the companionship of the Holy Ghost. Because we're baptized and members of the church does not mean we automatically have that gift. We have to earn it and we have to ask for it. He said, which I'll pour out upon you, and my word, which I'll reveal unto you, and be agreed as touching all things whatsoever ye ask of me, and be faithful until I come, and ye shall be caught up, that where I am ye shall be also. Amen. Now, there, in a nutshell, is the information on Adam on the Almond, a significant event in the history of all of the dispensations, when finally as a family we will all come together 
in preparation for the glorious second coming of the master and he will come he gave his word let's now go to section 28 the introductory part of it centers on Hiram page remember I mentioned he has found a seer stone he's getting revelations I have seen the Hiram page seer stone there's two of them the community of Christ owns them and I was privileged along with other religion teachers one day to be in their headquarters and they got them out and showed them to us they're flat rocks, I would guess a quarter inch thick, uh, a blue, gray, look like somebody's really buffed and polished and they're really smooth. And then they drilled a round hole about the size of your little finger through one end. They were referred to them as peep stones. And they have fairly good historical evidence that the one at least for sure belonged to Hiram Page and uh, perhaps it did, I don't know, but at least I had the chance to look at them, and I was not overly impressed. It's a rock with a hole through it. And Satan can use about any medium he wants to give false revelations. Let me mention a couple of things to you, though, about Hiram Page. He's born in Vermont in 1800. We don't know the exact date. Even as a young man, he studied, studied medicine and later will travel through New York and Canada blessing the lives of people because of his medical knowledge. He will eventually marry Catherine Whitmer, David Whitmer's sister, in November of 1825. Together, they'll be the parents of nine children. Oliver Cowdery baptized him on April 11, 1830. His wife, Catherine, was baptized at the same time. Hiram Page will become one of the eight witnesses. He will never deny that witness, and to his dying day will testify he did see and handle those plates. However, he'll be excommunicated in 1838. He stays in Missouri in the Excelsior Springs area. He lived outside of Excelsior Springs on a farm where he died August 12, 1852. For years, we thought he was buried right there in Excelsior Springs uh, in an old Baptist cemetery. Several years ago, uh, the Mormon Historical Society ran an ad about this trying to find his grave. They got a phone call from a family that owned a farm out of Excelsior Springs, and they said, we know where he's buried. We have been taking care of his grave for years, and our parents before us took care of it. And sure enough, just outside of a fence right by the road is the headstone. I stood there, and it's got Hiram Page's name on it, and they finally found it because this family, who had no idea who the man was, until the historical society there had run this ad as trying to find it, then they began to realize the significance of the man. And... Uh, uh, kind of a lonely place, a pretty place, but it's kind of on a little bit of a hill by an old road. And he's buried right to the side between the road and a, a fence. Uh, let's look at uh, verse 2. The Savior now speaks to Oliver, But behold, verily, verily, I say unto thee, No one, and that's an absolute, no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church excepting my servant Joseph Smith, Jr. He receiveth them even as Moses. Brothers and sisters, if ever there's a verse to memorize, it's that one right there. You'll never be led astray by false revelation of people claiming various things if you remember that only the president of this church can get revelation for the church. But note what it said there that Joseph Smith receiveth them even as Moses received them. Let's turn to the book of Numbers, to chapter 12, to see how it was that Moses received them. Let's see, Numbers 12, verse, uh, we'll start with verse 6. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, speak unto him in a dream. How many prophets are there in a church? Hundreds upon hundreds, based on the definition I gave you earlier. My servant Moses is not so. He's not just a prophet. 
who is faithful in all mine house. With him I will speak no mouth to mouth, even apparently, not in dark speeches, in the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. In other words, he will see his form, his person as an individual and will converse with him as one man converses with another. So it was with Joseph Smith, not so with Oliver Cowdery or Hiram Page, but with Joseph Smith, he knew the Lord and spoke to him face to face as one speaks to another. Is that the case with President Nelson? I would assume that he's in contact with the Son of God who does speak to him and teach him from time to time. Those things are most sacred and President Nelson will not openly discuss such things, but in the great millennial reign, we will come to know all of those things in God's intimate uh, dealings with his anointed servants. Now we have faith that it is so. So I'd note then by that verse 2, I'd put Numbers 12, verse 6 through 8, which will explain to you how Moses received revelation. Verse 3, And thou shalt be obedient unto the things which I shall give unto him, even as Aaron. Aaron was obedient to Moses, but remember, Aaron was three years older than Moses, but always honored his younger brother, whose position was prophet, seer, and revelator. Oliver Cowdery never saw himself that way because of his pride. He always saw himself as equal with Joseph Smith, never under the prophet. To declare faithfully the commandments and the revelations with power and authority. That's his responsibility. He's to teach the commandments that's been given and to help the people to understand them. Verse 5, But thou shalt not write by way of commandment, but by wisdom. Thou shalt not command him who is at thy head. I explained an example of that to you in section 20, verse 37. Verse 8, Now behold, I say unto you, ye shall go unto the Lamanites and preach my gospel. Before I move to that, I should mention to you that the Savior told Joseph Smith that Oliver Cowdery, who believed in Hiram Page's revelations, was to take Hiram aside and tell him that he'd got him from the devil. And Oliver Cowdery complied with that, and it's Oliver that convinces Hiram and the rest of the Whitmer family that the Revelations was false. Hiram Page will tear up the Revelations and destroy them. Now we move to another topic, and that's the mission to the Lamanites. So verse 8, he says, And preach my gospel unto them, and as much as they receive thy teachings, thou shalt cause my church to be established among them. Thou shalt have revelations, but write them not by way of commandment. Now behold, I say unto you, it's not revealed. See, Hiram Page was telling them where Zion would be. It is not revealed, and no man knoweth where the city Zion shall be built, but it shall be given hereafter. Now here comes a clue. The Savior gives a clue. Behold, I say unto you that it shall be on the borders by the Lamanites. The borders of the Lamanites, if you have the church history in the fullness of times, the Institute manual that was wrote many years ago, the new uh, publications the church has put out, the saints, supersedes that. And that's what we should study and now use as the saints. But I just suggest to you that that Institute manual is valuable for another reason, and that's because of the graphics that's in it. The graphics that's in that manual took two years to compile and put in there. There is a page in which it'll show you at the border of the Lamanite exactly where it was at. And you might want to take a look at that. It was the Indian Removal Act signed into law by Andrew Jackson, the 28th of May, 1830. So just uh, uh, a few months prior, it removed all of the Indian nations west of the Mississippi River and granted them the unsettled lands west of the Mississippi, and you know that that didn't last very long either. But that's what it meant by the border of the Lamites. So the saviors give a clue that the holy city will be built close to the border of the Lamanites. Well, that's about a thousand miles. And so the savior's gonna have to refine that and help even more. Oliver Cowdery is being sent down into the Independence area where the five nations are west of Independence, to begin to teach them. He would be terminate, uh, what we would terminate as the first mission president of the church. He's 24 years old. Oliver Cowdery is a remarkable man. 
I have nothing but praise for Oliver Cowdery. He's in charge of the mission. Ten, thou shalt not leave this place until after the conference held September 26, 1830. And my servant Joseph shall be appointed to preside over the conference by the voice of it. What he saith to thee, thou shalt tell. Now, the Savior is going to call others to go. Let's, we'll come back to that. But let's go over to section 30 to the Doctrine and Covenants to verse 5. Let's see, verse 5. Behold, I say unto you, Peter, Peter Whitmer, Jr., you shall take your journey with your brother Oliver, for the time has come, it's expedient me, you shall open your mouth to declare my gospel. Therefore, fear not. Give heed unto the words and advice of your brother, which he shall give you. And be you afflicted in all his afflictions, ever lifting up your heart unto me in prayer and faith. Now, my intent is not to cover the mission and all that they went through. I'll give you a source in a minute that I think you'd find would help you somewhat with that. Come over now. There's uh, a second one. Come over now to... Uh, section 32, we pick up two more that are assigned to go on this mission. Verse 1, now concerning my servant, Parley P. Pratt, behold, I say unto him that as I live, I will that he shall declare my gospel, learn of me, be meek and lowly of heart, and that which I appointed unto him as he shall go with my servants Oliver Cowdery and Peter Whitmer Jr. into the wilderness. Let me just quickly tell you why it's so significant he's called. Parley P. Pratt's come off of the Western Reserve, which is Ohio. When they start to the Indian nations, he tells them he knows where there's a group of people that might be interested. They go up to Buffalo, New York, where they work with some of the Indian tribes there, and then eventually they'll drop into Mentor and Kirkland, where in about two weeks they will bring into the church about 123 people, and some of those are so very prominent important in the church. Well, Parley P. Pratt knows them. In fact, his minister in that area is named Sidney Rigdon. And so we get introduced to him. Verse 3, Ziba Peterson also shall go with them, and I myself will go with them. Nothing shall prevail against them, and so forth. Okay, those are the ones that are called to go. We add a, one more when they get in Kirkland, they will baptize into the church a man named Frederick G. Williams, and he will ask permission to accompany them, which Oliver Cowdery grants, and he also will journey with them. Let me mention a couple of things about Parley P. Pratt. He's well known in the church. He come, he's born April 12, 1807 in Burlington, New York. Oliver Cowdery baptized him September 1, 1830. He's only been in the church not quite a month uh, when this revelation comes. He'll be called into the quorum of the 12th, February 14, 1835. He will be the second apostle killed in our dispensation. He will be killed on May 13, 1857 at Alma, uh, Arkansas. He will be killed by Hector McLean. The best source on him is the autobiography of Parley P. Pratt. I recommend that book to all members of the church that they should read and study the autobiography of Parley P. Pratt. Let me mention now to you Ziba Peterson. We don't have a lot of information on him. He is baptized April 18, 1830. He'll be excommunicated June 25, 1833. He never comes back. In 1848, he will take his family, leave Missouri, and he went to California. He will live at a place called Dry Diggins, and there he'll become the sheriff. He will hang two men. Some accounts say that was the first two that was hung in California, which is probably questionable. They later will name that area Hangtown, and that one is more familiar to us. And then soon after 1848, uh, Ziba Peterson dies, uh, not holding membership in the church. Okay, let's come back to uh, section 28, and let's come to verse uh, 14. Thou shalt assist to settle all these things 
according to the covenants of the church, before thou shalt take thy journey among the Lamanites. And it shall be given thee from the time thou shalt go until the time thou shalt return. That's one of the most fascinating events in church history, is that mission to the Lamanites and the ramifications of it and what all happened. Let's come now to section 29. This is a doctrinal section, great deal of information. i just mention something that you might find interesting and helpful. Note in the section heading it says that Joseph Smith received it in the presence of six elders. Here's the names of the six elders. Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, John Whitmer, Peter Whitmer Jr., Samuel Smith, Thomas B. Marsh. Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, John Whitmer, Peter Whitmer, Junior Samuel Smith, Thomas B. Marsh. That comes out of the Far West Record, which was compiled by Lyndon Cook. I didn't write the page down, but it's easy to find because you, you go in Far West Record by that date in that heading, September 26. So it's not hard to find it uh, because it goes chronological by date. Let's go to verse 5. He says, lift up your hearts and be glad, for I am in your midst. I am your advocate with the Father, and it is his good will to give you the kingdom. Daniel chapter 7 verse 18 says that when the Savior comes in his glory, he will give the kingdom back to us. A kingdom that we prepared for him. A kingdom that will become a celestial kingdom. Those who have been true and faithful, those who have kept the commandments, those who have served willingly in his kingdom, at some point he will give it back to us. This will be our home in the eternities to come. We will dwell on this planet when it is a resurrected celestial planet. So I would note then Daniel 7 verse 18 by that. Let's go to verse 7. It says, and ye are called to bring to pass the gathering of mine elect. Now note, for mine elect hear my voice and harden not their hearts. I'm going to give you three references. I'm going to take time to look them up. I'll just give them to you with an explanation. Here's where the elect hear God's voice. Doctrine and Covenants 1 verse 38. We hear it from his servants. That's his servants on a ward level, a stake level, a general authority level, whom he calls and raises up to love, to teach, and to help us. Second, Doctrine and Covenants 21, verse 4 and 5. We hear his word through the living prophet. DNC 21, 4 and 5. The third one, Doctrine and Covenants 18, verse 34 to 36. 1834 to 36, we hear his word through the scriptures. That's the three ways the elect hear his voice, and they obey that voice as they hear it. Let's come down to verse 8. Wherefore the decree hath gone forth from the Father, that they shall be gathered in unto one place. They is Israel. The one place it was Independence, Missouri, which later the Lord will change. Once the foundation's laid, the center place is identified, then the Lord moves out and now gathers to the stakes. All of, if you think of a tent, brothers and sisters, and you're going to put a tent up, a big tent, you lay it on the ground. You put the stakes in place out around it. And when they're in place, then you raise the tent. Then it goes up and those stakes hold it in place. That's what the Savior eventually will do, is begin to put the stakes in place throughout the nations of the earth in the day in which he will raise the center stake. Salt Lake City is a stake of Zion. It's not the stake. It is only a temporary headquarters. It eventually will be moved to Independence, Missouri gathered in unto one place upon the face of this land to prepare their hearts and be prepared in all things against the day when tribulation and desolation are sent forth upon the wicked. Now, here's a couple of references that might help as to why we gather to the stakes. 
The first one is Doctrine and Covenants, section 115, verse 6. Doctrine and Covenants, 115, verse 6. I would also note Harold B. Lee, Conference Report, April 1973, page 5. Harold B. Lee, Conference Report, April 1973, page 5. Plus, Joseph Smith said this, What was the object in gathering the Jews or the people of God in any age of the world? The main object was to build unto the Lord a house, whereby he could reveal unto his people the ordinances of his house, the glories of his kingdom, teach the people the way of salvation. For there are certain ordinances and principles that when they are taught and practiced must be done in a place or house built for that purpose. Teachings of Joseph Smith, page 307 to 308. Teachings of Joseph Smith, page 307 to 308. The purpose of the gathering is so that we are uh, in a place where we are protected. Priesthood leaders will give us clear guidance and help us through difficult times. Another reason is to build temples. Collectively, we can build hundreds of temples. Individually, we couldn't do it. I, I would never have enough money that I could build a temple, but collectively I've been able to help. My wife and I, by our tithes and offerings, have been able to help to build the temples throughout the world. That is one of the reasons you gather the people together. Collectively, we become strong, we become powerful. Priesthood leaders are put in place to give us clear direction and to help us through difficult times upon the earth. Now, starting with verse 9, he turns his attention, the Savior does, to his second coming. So verse 9, the hour is nigh. Think of the time this was given, 1830. Hour means short time. We've got to be down to minutes by now. The hour, for the hour is nigh, and the day soon at hand. When the earth is ripe, and all the proud, and they that do wickedly shall be as stubble. Now note, as stubble, which means the grain has been removed. The precious wheat been removed. DNC 88, 96 to 98. DNC 88, 96 to 98. Just briefly what that says. All of the faithful, both sides of the veil, will be caught up to meet the Savior. We will be active participants. We will be permitted to descend with him in glory. Who can begin to fathom what that will be like on that occasion to be worthy enough to be an actual participant in his second coming? That we don't stand on the earth and watch him come out of heaven. We get to come with him. He honors us because we have obeyed him and we have kept his commandments. And I will burn them up, burn them up by his presence. DNC 5 verse 19 saith the Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts means a God of war. What is it he wars against? Sin and evil and wickedness. That wickedness shall not be upon the earth. The hour is nigh. That which was spoken by mine apostles must be fulfilled. 11, for I will reveal myself from heaven with power and great glory with all the hosts thereof and dwell in righteousness with men on earth a thousand years. The wicked shall not stand. Now there is an order to the cleansing of the earth. And I'm, there's uh, three references that uh, we'll work through. The first one is in Revelation chapter 20. So if we can turn there, here's one of the first steps to bringing about peace upon our earth. Revelation 20, verse 1. John said, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. The bottomless pit's the depths of hell, meaning there was no end to the horror of that place. He laid hold on the dragon. Now, I don't take time to explain these, but these are titles of the devil, and they all have a specific meaning. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal upon him. Now, step one. Satan and that vast host that followed him will be shut up by an angel in authority 
in the bottomless pit, and a seal will be placed. The seal is on the outside. Satan cannot break the seal. If he gets out of there, someone on the outside must break it. And we know who it is that will break the seal. If I have time, I'll show you tonight. Now, let's come back now to Doctrine and Covenants, section 29, verse 11. Here is step two. In the verse it says that the wicked shall not stand. The Savior now, by fire, removes the wicked off of the earth. Step one, Satan and his host are shut up in the bottomless pit. Step two, the wicked are removed by fire. Let's go to step three, which is 1 Nephi, chapter 22. First Nephi 22, and it is verse 26. First Nephi 22, 26. And because of the righteousness of his people, Satan has no power. Wherefore, he cannot be loosed for the space of many years. He hath no power over the hearts of the people, for they dwell in righteousness, and the Holy One of Israel reigneth. What keeps Satan in the pit? The righteousness of the people, of the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's what keeps that seal intact, and Satan cannot get out. Those three references, then, are significant and important. Let's go back now to section 29. And let's see, we want to go now to verse 12 where we run into a little problem that can easily be explained. In verse 12, And again, verily, verily, I say unto you, and it hath gone forth in a firm decree by the will of the Father, that means it will not be altered, that mine apostles, the twelve, which were with me in my ministry at Jerusalem. Okay, that's the quorum of the twelve that was actually with him in his ministry in Jerusalem. That would include who? Judas, we got a problem then if it includes him. Now there is an answer and I'm going to show you. Before I do, note the promises to the Quorum of the Twelve. One, they shall stand at my right hand. That's the covenant hand. They're joint heirs with him. At the day of my coming and a pillar of fire, being number two, clothed with robes of righteousness. Number three, crowns upon their heads. Who wears crowns? Kings and royalty. In glory, even as I am, number four, to judge the whole house of Israel. Note, even as many as have loved me and kept my commandments. That is profound. There's no information on that. That quorum of 12 will judge the entire house of Israel, only those who've been righteous. Now, I don't know how you feel, but it's a privilege to meet with a bishop or the stake present, to be interviewed for a temple recommend or a calling, and to be asked those questions and to be able to answer those honestly. I remember one night, and I don't think he would mind, he's, he's died a few years ago. <clears throat> Brother Bob Matthews was on the correlation committee with us, and I remember him coming one night uh, when he was being released because President Hinckley called him to be a temple president. And he shared with us, he said, when I met with President Hinckley, he asked me one question. That was all he asked me. The question he asked me was, Brother Matthews, have you always been loyal to the brethren? It's the only thing he asked. He said, you can't imagine how I felt when I could look him in the eye and say, President, I've always been loyal to the brethren. That's the only question he asked him before he was called to be a temple president. I don't know what that judgment's about, but it's going to be one glorious experience to be with men as powerful as they are. Now let's resolve the problem when he says it's the quorum of twelve that was with him in Jerusalem. To do so, it's interesting that it's the New Testament that unlocks the Doctrine and Covenants. So now we need to turn to the book of Acts, to chapter 1. When Peter has assembled members of the church to discuss filling a vacancy caused by Judas, who has taken his life. We start with verse 21, Acts 1.21. Here we read, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John 
and to that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Peter sets the qualifications for the man who's going to fill Judas's place. He must be an individual who has accompanied them from the time the Savior was baptized to his ascension, that he's been an eyewitness on many occasions of the Master and what he's done. He was up on Olivet when the Savior ascended into heaven. Those are strict requirements that Peter has set. There are two men who uh, meet the qualifications. They appointed two, Joseph, called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias, and they prayed. In other words, after doing their homework, they've come up with the names of two men that qualify. They don't know which of the two. Both are wonderful, honorable men. Which one does the Lord went want? So they prayed. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place, which is hell. They gave forth their lots. Now their lots, and I don't know if you can see me, this is their lot. They raised their hand to sustain the revelation that came through Peter. He is our senior apostle on that occasion. He would have announced that he feels impressed that Matthias is chosen. They gave forth their sustaining vote. He was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now one more thing with them. This comes from Eusebius, the bishop of Caesarea. He said, there's evidence also that Matthias, who took Judas' place in a list of apostles, and the other man, Justice, honored like him, is in the drawing of lots, had been called to be among the 70, which is probably uh, correct, that both of these men are 70s, which means they are a special witness. They wear the apostolic mantle. Thus, because of their position in the Quorum of the 70, Thus, because of the strict requirements Peter set on who takes Judas' place, Matthias is now listed as the original member of the Twelve as though Judas had never been there. And so with that much help, this verse in the Doctrine and Covenants now becomes uh, much easier for you and I to understand what he means by it. Let's come down to verse 13. He speaks now of the resurrection. A trump shall sound both long and loud, even as upon Mount Sinai, all the earth shall quake. That'll be fascinating when that takes place, that a trump shall sound, send terror through the wicked, but to the righteous, it's not a loud blast of a horn. It'd probably be beautiful to listen if we're in tune with heaven. And they shall come forth, yea, even the dead which died in me, the righteous, to receive a crown of righteousness, to be clothed upon, meaning resurrected bodies. Even as I am, they will have a celestial body, as does the Savior, to be with me that we may be one. But behold, I say unto you that before this great day, now he's going to back up, he's going to tell us about some of the signs. Shall come, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall be turned into blood, the stars shall fall from heaven. In other words, cosmic disturbance, the likes of which has never been seen upon this earth from its beginning until that actually happens. Now, starting with verse 18 through 21, these verses deal with the battle of Gog and Magog, which in this case is a premillennial battle. I'll explain those verses in a minute. I'll give you a list of references that deal with the premillennial battle. You might have to write them quick. I'm only going to mention these one time. Here they are. Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. He had the most to say. Isaiah 34. Jeremiah 25. Joel chapter 1 through 3. Zephaniah 3, Zechariah 12 through 14, Book of Revelation 9, 11, 16. Those are major chapters that deal with the battle. There are other selected verses that fill in gaps, which we won't take time to elaborate on. 
Now, just with that much in mind, this verse 18 through 21 deals with this battle. Wherefore, I, the Lord God, will send forth flies upon the face of the earth, which shall take hold of the inhabitants thereof. Those inhabitants are dead. I'll show you in just a minute. And shall eat their flesh, shall cause maggots to come in upon them. Doesn't sound good, does it? The Savior put it there intentionally that it didn't sound good. There's two feasts. I just covered one with you. Adam on the almond, when we can partake of the sacrament of the Savior. Or you can be involved in this one if you don't want to keep the commandments. Their tongues shall be stayed. They shall not utter against me. Their flesh shall fall from off their bones and their eyes from their sockets. That sounds almost like some kind of a nuclear holocaust that will take place. Shall come to pass the beasts of the forest, the fowls of the air shall devour them up. And the great and abominable church, which is the whore of all the earth, shall be cast down by devouring fire. According as is spoken by the mouth of Ezekiel the prophet, who spoke of these things. Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, let's just look at a couple of verses, and we'll, I'll tie this much in of the battle for you. So I'm going to go now to the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament to chapter 39. Ezekiel 39. And let's start with uh, verse 4. This deals with this army that will finally move against Israel. And it says, Thou, Gog and Magog, shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. He's speaking then of the dead who will die in that land, and he will then give them, give them to those birds and animals that eat flesh. Come now to verse 17. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, Speak unto every feathered fowl, to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come. Gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye eat flesh and drink blood. Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of goats, of bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan. That's interesting symbolism, which we won't take time to explain. But suffice to say that Doctrine and Covenants 29, 18 through 21 deals with this tremendous battle that will finally climax in the Holy Land, and there will be so many dead that uh, it'll take them months to bury them. That's all me so mentioned in Ezekiel 39, if you choose uh, to, con to continue to work on that. Let's go now to verse 22. And again, verily, verily, I say unto you that when a thousand years are ended, men again begin to deny their God. Then will I spare the earth but for a little season. And so now we ask the question, what has ended the millennial reign? Why is it that men and women now become evil again? I'll show you the answer and who it is that breaks that seal. To do that, we need to go to the book of 4th Nephi in the Book of Mormon. 4th Nephi. And verse uh, 20. <clears throat> they have a millennial society for just under 200 years. Then note verse 20. And he, Amos, kept it, the record, eighty and four years. There was still peace in the land, save it were a small part of the people, members of the church of Jesus Christ, who had revolted from the church. A small group apostatized, probably over some silly, ridiculous thing. I still remember years ago reading in the history of the church where President Young announced to the people that they would build a temple in Salt Lake. He had seen it in vision. And he said, brothers and sisters, please don't leave the church. When I tell you I'm going to put six spires on it, I know Joseph Smith only put one on the two he built, but God told me I can put six on this one. I think he tucked his tongue into his cheek and was having fun with him. He'd seen him leave the church, various people, over everything you can ever imagine. 
Okay, that's the start. A small group leaves the church. Now, as you finish the book, by the time you get to the end, we got bloodshed. We've got them divided into two major nations. They're committing every sin you can think of. With that in mind, let's now go to the book of Isaiah to chapter 65. Isaiah 65. And verse 17, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. That has reference to the earth becoming a terrestrial paradisical world as it starts its long ascension back to God the Father. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoice and in her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. He's talking about the millennium. There shall be no more thence in infinite days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. Now I'm going to read it with the JST. For the child shall not die, but shall live to be a hundred years old. But the sinner living to be a hundred years old shall be accursed. You have to ask yourself, who is he talking about when he says the sinner in the millennial reign? He is speaking, brothers and sisters, of a group of people at the end of the millennium who apostatize over some silly reason. And eventually wickedness is again on the earth and that seal is broken and Satan comes out. Whoever breaks that seal, Elder McConkie says, will be perdition. Here are the references. Articles of Faith, New Witness for the Articles of Faith by Brother McConkie, page 652. Articles of Faith, page 652. Doctrines of Salvation, volume 1, page 87. Doctrines of Salvation, volume 1, page 87. Now, let's go back, just finish a couple more things in section 29. I picked out a couple of things that I thought maybe were a little bit harder to see if I could offer some help with them. I'm going to start with verse uh, 26. But behold, verily I say unto you, before the earth shall pass away. Now, when he says pass away, now we're talking about it becoming a celestial planet. I didn't take time to put it in context, but that's what it is. Michael, mine archangel, shall sound his trump. Then shall all the dead awake, all who have not been resurrected. During the millennium, celestial terrestrial will be resurrected. Sometime after the millennium, the telestial in perdition. For their graves shall be opened, they shall come forth. Yea, even all. The righteous, the righteous or the faithful members that will have eternal life, shall be gathered on my right hand unto eternal life. The wicked on my left hand will I be ashamed to own before the Father. Verse 27 deals only with members of the church. He speaks of two groups, one that will have eternal life and the other one that will be perdition. Now, how many will be perdition? We have no idea. The Lord hasn't given that kind of information. I would note by it, Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 2, page 229, 230, Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 2, page 229, and 230. Let's go to verse 31. For by the power of my Spirit created I them, yea, all things both spiritual and temporal. First, spiritual. That has reference to Adam and Eve's physical bodies, a spiritual, physical body body there was no blood in their bodies secondly temporal that has reference to the fall when Adam and Eve fell and become mortals with blood in their bodies which is the beginning of my work work on the earth with mortal man and again first temporal which means mortals who now die secondly spiritual which deals with the resurrection which is the last of my work verse it a little difficult but we still can understand. Verse 36, 
It came to pass that Adam being tempted of the devil, for behold, the devil was before Adam. Now, Adam is the name he's known on earth. When it says he was before Adam, it has reference to pre-earth life. It doesn't mean that he's older than Michael or trying to put anybody in seniority in pre-earth life. It simply means that the devil existed before Adam was a mortal man on the earth. For he rebelled against me, saying, Give me thine honor, which is my power. I will explain what that means when I get to section 76. A third part of the hosts of heaven turned thee away from me because of their agency. Verse uh, 40. Wherefore it came to pass the devil tempted Adam. He partook of the forbidden fruit and transgressed the commandment wherein he became subject to the will of the devil because he yielded unto temptation. Wherefore I, the Lord God, caused he should be cast out from the garden of Eden from my presence because of his transgression wherein he became spiritually dead. Simply means he's removed from the Father, which is the first death which all of us have suffered. We have been removed from the presence of our Father in heaven. Even that same death, which is the last death, which is spiritual, which shall be pronounced upon the wicked, reference to perdition. When I shall say, Depart ye cursed. Unfortunately, there will be perhaps many involved in that. But behold, I say unto you that I, the Lord God, gave unto Adam and unto his seed, they should not die as to the temporal death until I, the Lord God, should send forth angels to declare unto them repentance. That's how the Lord's always, always restored the dispensation is by heavenly messenger. Repentance and redemption through faith on the name of mine only begotten Son. Now in verse 42, that is not God the Father speaking, even though it sounds like it. It is Christ speaking by divine investure. Here is a reference where President Oaks explains what I just said. It's a little book called His Holy Name, page 16. Dallin Oaks, His Holy Name, page 16. I know that that can foul you up in scriptures, but that's who that is, is Christ speaking by divine investure. Come over to 45. They love darkness rather than light. Their deeds are evil. They receive their wages of him whom they list to obey. That is significant. If we're true and faithful, the Savior is the one who will give us our wages. Those who break commandments and live wicked lives will have to receive their wages from the devil. And one can only imagine what a horrible experience that might turn out to be. Behold, I say unto you that little children are redeemed from the foundation of the world through mine only begotten. The great discourse on that is Moroni chapter 8, wherefore, 47, wherefore they cannot sin. For power is not given unto Satan to tempt little children till they become accountable. Doctrine and Covenants section 68 verse 25. Now a warning, verse 48. Is given unto them even as I will according to mine own pleasure, that great things may re be required at the hand of their fathers. We are responsible as parents in Zion to teach our children the gospel of Jesus Christ that they'll have every opportunity to grow to be righteous and profitable servants. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for the opportunity to learn this evening. We're grateful for the scriptures and the words that we've heard tonight and ask that thou might bless us to be able to ponder them, to understand even more, and most importantly, that it may help us keep the commandments and do what is right. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.